Hi all, and welcome back to the Sovereignty Series. So I want to take you down a little bit of a different path than you might have anticipated, uh, because in this space, we speak a lot about the, the many ways we can connect dots in our lived experience so that we can start to live a more sovereign existence and reclaim all of the power that we've given away to our victim-based illusions. And I uh, would like to foreground what I have come to understand as being one of the greater psychological operations that are being run um, on the population right now, which has roots in feminism and really extends into an expression that could actually be characterized as a war on masculinity. And this is certainly not a conversation I anticipated myself ha having, you know, uh, maybe even 10 years ago when I thought of myself very much as a, a militant feminist, a belligerent uh, against all things uh, mankind, kind of a feminist and believed no. in elective C-sections and birth control and, you know, I can do what they can do bleeding um, and I've come a long way. So I'm excited to be in conversation with Omra Pani, who I think is one of the most important voices out there on this subject and many others, will sort of touch on a, a collection of issues today. Um, so welcome, Om. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you. For, yes, glad to be here. So I, I would like to talk really about uh, the war on Eros. And I have conceptualized the the role of Eros and, and really what it means to me when I look at, you know, what the state of humanity is and what it is that we can and should be doing about it um, as the potential, you know, sort of destination, uh, because there is a, a warfare consciousness that we are steeped in, whether it's our antibiotics and our antidepressants, whether it's the way that we interact with all that we hate about our lived experience or government or systems. And it's certainly very present in the patterns of our romantic relationships. So if we can transform this warfare consciousness, where are we going, right? So one of the places where we might be going is into complementarity and the ways in which we can organize ourselves into mutually beneficial roles. So I would love to really begin with your take on, on Eros, what it is and why you think it's such an important topic at this moment. My approach uh, has always been very practical, very pragmatic. I'm not an ideologue. I'm actually very liberal and uncommitted as far as ideologies are concerned. I am interested in what works. I am 52 years old right now. Anybody of my generation, our younger generation, we all grew up feminists. We are all in the soup since the 1960s. You can't really avoid it. Even when you think you're not, you are. Even the people in the Midwest who may think they're traditionalist, they're all feminists. We don't even have a conception of what it means to come out of it. We have received a certain message about masculinity and femininity, and we are imbued in it, and we grew up in it. And we all want to be successful in life. Women want to be successful women. Men want to be successful men. Men want to know how they can be successful with women. What is it that women want from men? How should they be? And the message that both sides have received is seeped in kind of the feminist framework for pretty much everybody of our generation and younger, pretty much everybody alive today. And I would be totally okay with it. I would be totally okay with it saying the future is female, all the feminist agenda, yay, hooray, if it worked, if it worked, if it made women happy, if it gave women, my God, my life is good. If it made men happy, if we had thriving relationships everywhere, women could say, I adore my, I adore my feminist submissive man. I adore my nice guy. I do. I love him. Oh, my God. What a wonderful world we are living in. Filled with nice guys, with submissive men, willing to respond to our emotions. Be there for us. It's not working. Mm -hmm. It's not working. The, the results aren't there. Yeah. Women are not doing that well. 
Uh, they may be doing well financially. They are not doing that well emotionally these days. They're not feeling great about themselves. They are not happy in their relationships. Their relationships are a mess. They are not doing great in their life choices. They aren't. They are living uh, in such a way that does not correspond to their biology, right? Your own gynecologist will tell you your fertility peaks at 28. Your own gynecologist will label your pregnancy at 35 a geriatric pregnancy. This isn't ideology, except women are zipping by their peak fertility at 28, not even thinking about getting married or having kids till mid 30s, not being able to conceive, being really old by the time the first child comes, then coddling that child to death, spending a lot of money, a lot of misery in artificial fertilization. It's not an easy process. I have friends who have gone through it. Your life choices aren't working. Your lives aren't working according to this agenda. Men are miserable. Men are flailing around. Men don't know what to do with women. They can't find a way to succeed with women. This model isn't serving us. You want to destroy polarity, turn women more masculine, turn men more feminine. Let's try it all. We have run this experiment. If the results were, oh my God, have you ever seen such a thriving population of men and women? We finally cracked it. We finally figured out what the stupid things we've been doing for hundreds of years and we finally adjusted and look at us. These are, this is the kind of progress we have made in medicine, in other areas. We have reduced poverty. We have increased our health, our lifespan. There has been progress in the world. I don't see the same progress in man, women relating. I don't see the same progress in family life. I don't see the same progress in our happiness in relationships. Uh, so we, the, the model needs to be reevaluated. Right? It's really not working. And I approach it from that perspective. What works? What's effective? What, so what adjustment can we make post-feminism to get back to the goodness? And that's my investigation. I want to fix problems. I want to make things better in my life and other people's lives. I want relationship to be better. I want Eros to be better. Our fertility rates are dropping all over the place. That's a big marker in society. When your fertility rates are dropping, when reproduction rates are dropping, that's a downfall of a culture. That's a downfall of a society. That is not a mark of success, right? So if we don't look at this and think, uh, hey, this is not working, something needs to be adjusted, I think then we truly are being willfully ignorant. Then we are so gung-ho on our ideology, like I'm going to take it to my grave, but I will not change. Your choice, entirely up to you. I look myself at the, I think part of how I, I began to wake up to this is because I would look at the, the fruits of feminism, right? And I would look at the birth control pill or medicalized birth or women in the workplace um, and paying taxes and valuing that kind of hustle up the, the ladder more than their role in the family unit. And each one of those I've come to challenge, you know, the value of. And so all of these fruits of feminism uh, seem to also stem from a, a woundology, right? If I could borrow Carolyn Mace's term and uh, the resentment and bitterness and victim consciousness that comes with that woundology, which is a, a whole string of beliefs, right? That men owe women that the only way out is to establish egalitarian, um, uh, you know, sort of gender roles and I personally am of the belief system that feminism is actually a socially engineered psychological operation that was at least in part intended to get women into the tax paying workplace, get children into industrialized factory oriented schooling and to fragment 
the family so as to remove the protective influence of the, the masculine figure. And so here we are, right, in this in this sort of charnel ground that you've described. Yeah. You talk a lot about, and I had come upon this, this ideology actually through the Freudian literature, um, the what is sometimes called the castration effect or, or the ways in which a, a wounded mother, right, which probably could describe all mothers at this point in our evolution, um, the way that she mothers a son in particular and emasculates him subconsciously perhaps for her own protection uh, and you, you see that as do I and, and many others as as the root of a lot of the um, the tension that is I mean to put it euphemistically that's created for men right now right that they they have to be nice boys that mommy loves and feel safe around yeah. but then the women that are seeking to relate to men as adults want these alphas right we want a man who who knows how to be an actual man so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the the origin story, um, at least in these dynamics between men and women, and how, in many ways, it starts in um, the mother son dynamic. Yeah, the damage done in that area is absolutely incalculable. You speak of feminism being a deliberate sabotage ploy. I don't know about exact conspiracy theories, but if this is the conspiracy theory, this succeeded because its effect has been essentially that either they were doing it deliberately or they were doing it non-deliberately but feminism and this ideology has been absolutely brilliant in destroying the fabric of so many aspects of our life and that's one of them right single motherhood Right. I came to this country in 1983 at the age of 13. Any immigrant who comes to this country watches a lot of TV. And I have been seeing single motherhood glamorized and pedestalized, worshipped. Ooh, the, the poor single mother. And the only time the father would come in it would be as a deadbeat dad. How can you how can you not hold up the poor abandoned mother with her children needing help, needing help from the state? And all oh, the terrible men abandoning their children. Yeah, good narrative. Is it true? Is it really true? 85% of divorces seem to be filed by women. Women break up most of the engagements. Who is destroying the family? Who is ripping apart the parental unit? Why are they doing it? Right? And the result of that, both on men and women, but I coach a lot of men, without exception, it almost seems these days, men have been raised by mothers and absent fathers. And that's destructive enough. What goes beyond that is the mother they were raised by was not a very big fan of masculinity, <laughs> was not a very big fan of their own father. So you got all these boys, first of all, who don't have a father figure, who are being raised by angry, resentful mother, who's telling them men are crap, your father is crap, our life is worse off because of your father. My life is worse off because of your father, even when he's absent. The level of damage this does on the psyche of boys and young men is incalculable. It's incalculable. Sometimes I wonder whether it's even reversible because mm. it goes in there very early. The absolute destruction this does to the psyches of boys, the message they completely incorporate into their internal narrative. Men suck. Grown men are useless. Grown men cause good women misery. Grown men cannot make women happy. Right? Eventually, these women who we, are, we want to make happy, they're going to end up hating us. Wow. You want to take on that challenge? You want to look forward to being a married man after that point? 
You want to pick up that gauntlet? I wouldn't. And whether they are able to articulate this or not, the message is in there. The self-defeating message that relationships basically are not going to work. I'm going to fail in my man-woman relating. Even the woman I think I love, I'll probably end up disappointing her. She will probably end up hating me. She'll probably end up leaving me. Nobody talks about this because nobody's interested in talking to men. Nobody's interested in talking about men. And men don't talk about themselves. So we think none of this is actually occurring. Right? But this is like, you know how they say sometimes, I've heard this, uh, that uh, children sometimes when they are hard of hearing, and they have not been diagnosed with hearing problems, people think they are stupid because they don't respond. So people think they must be dull. It's a stupid kid. No, he's, he has a hearing problem. He can't hear you. I feel kind of a similar problem going on with masculinity. Men don't talk about these things. Men don't hold up placards on Washington, D.C. Now, these days, they are a little bit more. So we think everything is fine. Men are fine. Men are still the evil patriarchy. And inside, these men are destroyed. They are so filled with self-doubt. Their esteem is so damaged. that. Uh, and on the outside, you're telling them you are the evil power that needs to be taken down. Men aren't feeling terribly powerful these days. I got to tell you. Young men are not feeling terribly powerful and esteemed. They don't feel like villains. They feel like they should just crawl into a cave and die. That they are no good, never will be any good. Nobody wants them. They're not good for anything anyway. So if there was a conspiracy to destroy a culture, they succeeded. There's no better way than to say we are going to take a generation of men in a country and we are going to obliterate their self-image. Congratulations. We are there now. Deliberate, undeliberate, I do not know. But it's it's here. And it's tragic. It's heartbreaking, right? And then what happens? You think any part of society is going to remain isolated? No. These are the men that, for better or for worse, you women now have to partner with. And how great is that? <laughs> and then the litany starts. Men today are boys. Men today don't have a spine. Men today are not growing up. Men today can't hold us. Men today have no confidence. No shit. Really? What do you think was going to happen? Have a generation of men raised by angry women who hate men. What do you think was going to happen? We have a problem. Yeah, I mean, I'm very interested in, I do tend toward the conspiratorial um, mindset, and I'm very interested in the role of trauma-based mind control. And I know that if you want a population that is living with a baseline of fear, you create the conditions for there to be an absence of this vibration of masculinity, right? Like yeah. I was watching this show Outlander recently and I've learned a lot about men, women relating from that show actually. And there was a scene, right? Where the protagonist of the woman in the show is abducted essentially. And all of the men from her community, her tribe, come and rescue her and like slay all of the offenders, right? And the same thing happens for the protagonist. At a certain point, he is rescued by this, actually several points, but this like group of men who come, like strong, powerful, courageous men. And all I could think was, we, I need that as a woman. I need men behind me of that caliber. And men need men behind them of that caliber. And we don't have that. So how could our nervous systems possibly be in optimal balance, poss possibly be in the, the state of the sort of predatorial state where we can make our own decisions, engage our sovereign choice. Yep. We are very vulnerable right now, um, whether, you know, you're looking at it through that lens or just sort of having, you know, ridden the different waves of, you know, moving from heart disconnected polarity in the fifties where, you know, the housewife was doing her job and her role and, and the man was in his role, but there was, you know, a lot of uh, lack of sacredness in the dynamic and we needed to go there. Yeah. We needed to swing all the way into this feminist pole to really make the conscious choice. And I want to talk about that at the end, you know, you know, what conscious kink is and BDSM and where that fits into this, um, this sort of uh, menu of choices that we have. 
Um, yeah. But I want to talk specifically about something I really have appreciated the way you've uh, spoken about, which dovetails on, on the end of what you were just saying, which is the role of esteem for men, right? So for, for a man, um, his reputation, his esteem, his sense of worth, his actual sense of usefulness for a man to feel needed is a, actually a very different thing than it is for the average um, feminine essence woman. And you speak about one of the remedies being that women can choose to no longer speak ill of men. And I had come to this practice maybe a month before I watched your first video that I came across on it, where you talk about speaking ill of men and what it actually says, not only about, you know, the woman's relationship to, to men and masculinity, but actually about herself you know, when she is in a practice of speaking this way about men. And obviously we do this, I call it commiseration uh, communication. We do this as women, you know, we do it. And yeah. I have an agreement with all of my girlfriends that we, we catch each other when we're doing that, whether it's about, you know, the pool guy or the husband um, enough. And so I would love for you to speak about, you know, the, the role of that commitment um, and why, why, why should we engage in, sort of speech hygiene when it comes to, you know, the way that women speak about men in general? Well, in a way, I think the two big topics you mentioned uh, just now, they're very interrelated. Uh, maybe we can start with the first one and kind of see how the other one shows up. The first one is about men being fearless, men being protectors. And you need a certain element of dangerousness in men for them to be able to fill these roles. If you're going to go protect your women, even if you're going to go protect and rescue a man, you, you have to be willing to face danger. You have to be in touch with your killer. You have to be willing to sacrifice yourself. You have to be willing to do harm. That's what it means to be a protector. You can't be a protector if you're not willing to get into confrontation. You can't be a protector if you're not willing to attack if that need be. You need to be fearless. You need to be strong. You need to have that as part of your character. Now, that part has been systematically destroyed. The second part of women disrespecting their men follows from that. But the first part is this is again. So, you know, th this is not even like we are we are talking about the angry feminist in the origin in the 1960s. This is like literally a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned this in a video about women are paying the price for the destruction of masculinity. And what I'm, I mentioned some very specific points because I really like to be specific. I don't like to talk in, talk in generalities. One of the points is... The feminist civils are saying these days, we want men to be afraid of women. I'm like, really? Are you sure? But they are saying it. You can probably find this on YouTube. There was a panel on Piers Morgan and he was talking about men don't want to marry these days. Men don't want to approach women these days. Men are dropping out of the dating game or the mating game or the marriage game. And he was saying, is it me too? are partly responsible for this. You have made it so difficult. You have made it so punitive for men to even approach women that they're they're afraid. And the feminist on the panel said, good, mm -hmm. good. I want men to be afraid of women. Well, that's really? how you punish. You punish the bad daddy that way through projection. No, no, well, but here's the thing. Uh, those are not going to be your heroes. No. You think that is what inspires a man to be your hero and your rescuer and your protector and your defender that he's afraid of you? Are you kidding? Do you? No. And the, and the tragedy is the feminist has succeeded. Men today are afraid of women. Men today are afraid of women. And you know what that evokes in women? Disgust. Yes. So, if out of that disgust they start bad mouthing men, that part actually is natural. Mm -hmm. That's actually the natural response in the feminine 
when they see a man who is that weak. So this is what you are creating. This, these are the dominoes. You want men to come on college campuses and you want to sit them down and tell them, don't be rapists. Be scared of women. And feel your feelings. That's the other part. And of feel your feelings. Aspect. And you have succeeded and men are terrified. They're absolutely terrified of women these days. Our, your last vice president, Pence, saying, I don't want to be in a room alone with a woman. It's not a heroic statement. It's a practical statement based in fear. He is saying, if I am alone in a room with a woman, in today's climate, she could destroy me. That's the way you've rigged the game. That's where you have brought these supposedly guardians of patriarchy. White men don't get whiter than Mike Pence. Mike Pence is saying, Mike, that was his name, right? The vice president? Who, who, uh, that I don't want to be alone in a room with a woman. It's not judicious for me. That's a man afraid of women. So... Congratulations to feminists. You've scared the most powerful white men in your society, the keepers of your patriarchy, so-called, in being afraid of women. And what is your response as women to men who are that afraid of you? It's revulsion. Mm -hmm. You want to gouge those men's eyes out, right? Are we allowed to curse on your broadcast? Yes. <laughs> you certainly don't want to fuck them. You don't. They don't evoke your arousal. They don't evoke like, I want that man. Ooh, the man who's so afraid of me. Ooh, come take me now. No, it doesn't work that way. It evokes disgust. It evokes revulsion. Every primal circuit in your brain says, this is not the guy to be with. How the hell is this guy going to protect me if he's afraid of me? Right, because if you need protection, that means bigger villains than you have gotten hold of you. If this man is afraid of you, how the hell is he going to face bigger monsters? It doesn't compute. You want your man to be a fucking monster and be your monster. That's always been the logic. You want a man who's a killer, but who's your killer. That's always been the equation since caveman days. Get me the most dangerous man who can kill on my behalf. Get me the most dangerous man who's not going to kill me, but is completely capable of killing me. That's the one I'm going to open my legs for, because that makes sense. Because this world is terrifying, and it is filled with horrible people. And you are a frail little woman with two babies on your tits. You can't do anything when you're that vulnerable. You need protection if you're going to procreate. Who is going to protect you? Men who are afraid of you? No, your entire system says wrong choice. Absolutely wrong choice. And if we as a culture, including those Dark edible mothers are creating sons that are such milk toast that they have no edge to them. We are fucked. You've also talked about two other corollaries to this, which I think are essential because this disgust is the barometer. Almost every woman I know can relate exactly to what you're saying. And, and one of the corollaries is that we have girlfriended our partners, right? We want to be able to chitty chat with them and we waste the currency of their yeah. greatest superpower, which you say and others say is their attention. And then we also are encouraging culturally, which I think is a part of this PSYOP, men to feel their feelings. Isn't it time for men to get in touch with their emotions? And you have, uh, I think, spoken to this so powerfully because that sounds like a nice idea. It sounds like a compassionate idea, actually. But is that what men need to be doing in order to get in touch with their power? And is that what women actually want men? Do they, we, we actually want hysterical, tantruming men? Or does that, you know, sort of clench our rectums, as you say, right? Does that also inspire disgust? 
So I think that those are other, you know, parts it, of this. It, yeah, mm -hmm. it does inspire discussion. And I think there is a, there's a false premise in the middle of this argument, which is we are equating men being emotionally complex and mature beings with men being emotional. Mm -hmm. it, there's no equivalency. You can be a solid man, an impassive man, a ferocious man, a killer of a man, and in the evening, sit down with your glass of brandy and read Emerson. So any idea that men, Emerson, Whitman, Thoreau, men, Shelley, Byron, Shakespeare, men, wrote about emotions, wrote great plays, excavated human nuances and feelings and emotions, wrote poetry. So where did this premise come from that somehow men are separate from their emotions? We never have been separate from our emotions. No, the bullshit is, do you actually want emotionality in men? There is no equivalency between emotionality and a man having passions, a man having nuance in his emotions and feelings, man falling in love, man being tender, man loving his children, man loving his pets, man loving nature. When, when has there ever been? Of our greatest poets through history have been men. Right? Robert Frost simply communing with nature writing poetry doesn't mean he has to be an emotional mess in life. Where, where did this equivalency come from? That men are just emotionally retarded. Your best fucking literature was written by men, and those men weren't pussies. Those men carried daggers and sabers and went to war. So this whole idea is bullshit. That somehow, in our generation, we are going to allow men access to their emotion bullshit nonsense no in our generation we're gonna teach men how to become watery women that's what's actually happening and i would i would echo that this is the beginning of the erosion of the contract the sacred contract is because when a woman is with a man who does not know how to self-contain and who is emotionally um, demonstrative or reactive is, you know, the sort of psychological term, she cannot respect him. And if she cannot respect him, she can't give him the admiration and the guardianship of his reputation and all of that appreciation that he deserves and needs in order to fulfill his end of the contact, the contract, which is containing her, right? Would you, would you agree with that? I would completely agree with that. I would say there is, I always trust genuine response in both men and women. A wet pussy does not lie. A hard cock does not lie. A woman who is embodying her femininity in such a way that she inspires adoration in a man, that's a genuine circuit. You want to shave off your head, put on 100 pounds and tattoo your face and then complain no man responds to you is because you have fucked up the circuit of what inspires adoration in men towards women. Similarly, when you create emotional weak men, your third chakra will not respect those men. That response is correct. Your system has not gone awry. Compared to that, a man who can hold his own, he will command your respect. That's a appropriate circuit, right? So I would be like, trust your own turn on. Even the staunch feminists today sometimes are honest enough to say, we fucking hate feminist men. We don't want to fuck these feminist men. I'm like, good, good. At least you are checking into your sex and saying, hey, it turns out, all these allies we have, we don't want to take them to bed. They revolt us. 
Good. You're listening finally. Can you see the discrepancy between your internal energetic body and the ideology you set up in the political realm? Trust your body. Trust your turn on. Trust your turn on over all ideology. Right? Create the kind of man that does evoke respect in you. You want to go further? Create the kind of man that makes you a little bit afraid. The kind of man you would think twice before fucking with him. You want to reverse that circuit. You don't want a man who's afraid of you. You actually want a man you are at least a little bit afraid of. And you know who the first man to embody that energy was supposed to be? Your father. Your father was supposed to be a man that made you think, do not fuck with this man. Fear this man. And that was good. That was healthy. Hear that correctly. Today we are like hell-bent on hearing everything badly. Not saying the father was abusive or psychopathic. No, no, no. A good, solid father should command that respect, should command that tiny dose of healthy fear in children. That's a correct circuit. That's a man you look up to. Right? You want to destroy all of that. You want men who are weaker than you, who fear you. You want men who are so weak they create revulsion instead of respect. Things are not going to work out. Right? Trust your system. Your, your circuits are still correct. Those are the circuits I am trying to realign things with. That's my guideline. I'm looking at the real data. I'm like, well, weak men are not inspiring love and adoration from women. So obviously this shit isn't working. Weak men aren't inspiring women to have sex with these guys. That circuit isn't working. Who are the men women are actually going for? I trust your turn on. I trust your arousal. I trust the man you get crazy about and have infatuations about. I trust where your heart goes, who you fall in love with. You don't fall in love with weak men. You just don't. Yeah, you call them nice guys, right? Yeah, we have a, we have a pandemic of those right now. And so you, you offered a caveat about abusive dynamics. And I think that part of why I find this you know, arena that you traffic in so fascinating is because there is there is a fine line uh, between, and I want to read a quote from your book, there's a fine line between what we would otherwise recognize as potentially abusive or even, you know, trauma-based dynamics and the reclamation of this polarity. So yeah. talk to us about what a sacred dynamic you know, you, you can even teach if you want a little bit about the, um, what you call the seven chakra marriage, not in depth, obviously, but just touch on that. Like, what does this sacred dynamic look like? And how does it look different than a little girl scared of her, you know, daddy, you know, um, what is, what are the components of the contract? Like, what is the woman's role? What is the man's role generally? And yeah. what are some of the ways that this um, sort of intentional and conscious hierarchical engagement are actually devotional in, in nature. At the first chakra level, protection and provision. These are the two energies that live there, right? You want a man who's capable of protecting you. Well, what does that imply? He needs to be dangerous. He needs to be powerful. He needs to be ferocious. He needs to be a wolf. Now, are you the kind of woman who recognizes that wolf, who actually nourishes his wolfishness? Right? We used to. You know, when we used to, when your lives were really perilous, out in the frontier, where there were actually enemies coming to rape and kill you in the middle of the night, you had no doubt that the men you were surrounded with, they needed to be killers. As early as possible, you would turn your sons into killers. You would hand them a rifle at age 10, 11, 12, 13 and put them on the porch. You did not have tolerance for weak men. They would get themselves killed and you killed. There's no room for error there when there's that much danger. Right? So if you want protection from that wolf, nurture the wolf. Be a woman 
who can be with that wolf, be a woman who inspires that man's wolfishness. Being a scary woman, scarier than your husband, doesn't inspire that. Right? Provision. Help him do better in life instead of being some kind of a consumptive succubus, which is what women seem to be these days. Women hit their 30, 35, they want to get married, but it really seems like they want to marry a wallet. <clears throat> Are you going to build his home? No. Are you going to clean his clothes? No. Are you going to cook his food? Fuck no. What's your contract? In the provision part, what are you bringing? What are you magnifying? Right? Is this actually a marriage? If he's bringing in money and provision, what are you doing with that to create a bond at the first chakra level? What is your part in the protection provision circuit? That would be a good marriage at the first chakra level. That would be a good partnership because then together you are strengthening what needs to be strengthened. And you're, you're helping each other build the heart with good protection and good provision to see, through, see each other through winters. At the second chakra level, your sex only opens to a man you can surrender your sex to. What kind of man is that? Pick that man. I'm not deciding your ideology. You ask your own sex, where do you actually thrive? You thrive in sexual surrender. What kind of man inspires your sexual surrender? The boy who's afraid of you or the man who knows how to handle your body and take you into subspace, into your sexual surrender, who knows how to take you into your suppleness. That would be a happy second chakra marriage. At the third chakra, what really works? What really works is a man looking at a man and almost can't believing I have this man. That's a happy thing at the third, third chakra where the woman looks at the man and like, look at this guy. Wow. That's my guy. That's my man. Right. And it's also great if the man can look at the woman and, and almost feel that same adoration. Can't believe she's with me. Look at this amazing woman. If they both feel that way, that's a great fucking romance. Right. But do we have that these days? Are women living in such a way that men can give them that adoration? Are you going to decide your own rules? I'm going to have a triple digit body count, but when it's time for me to settle down, you should just think of me as that wonder. Like, no, sorry. You don't get to determine everything. Men have their own standards about which women they're going to be with for a night and which women they're going to say, look at this woman. This woman has value. This woman is a prize. And I have this woman, which means I must be doing something right in life. And I want to keep this woman happy. I want to be deserving of this woman. That's a great circuit to have. Are you creating that? Are you just demanding men just give that to you? Are they giving it to you? Is it working out? Right? Just those three levels are enough. We don't even need to go higher. If you can make those three levels work, that's a brilliant relationship. But we are stumbling and falling at each one of those. Make those three circuits work and you've got a great relationship. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about containment uh, because you have a whole video series, which is incredible about it. And you give this example that I thought was extraordinary about the hug. Um, yeah illustration and that you know if if it if a woman's offering um devotional offering to a man is to guard his reputation to show him appreciation to make him bigger uh as you yeah. say and the exchange is this containment offering absolutely, uh, absolutely. speak a little bit about that i would even i wouldn't even put it as an exchange per se i would say this is one of the gifts a masculine has to offer the feminine is to offer her containment and again to give that containment he needs that first chakra in place he needs his own strength his own stoicism his own wolfishness his own bigness his own lack of emotionality so that he can offer this containment to his woman he can make her feel held and grounded right it doesn't mean processing her every day and being her girlfriend and listening to everything she has to say 
but it does mean giving her this energetic and emotional containment, especially when she's flailing around, right? And sometimes a great hug and a hold between a man and a woman does that. But as I explained in the video, it isn't necessarily about the physicality of it, right? Because the example I give is, you know, give your woman a nice big hug like she is your mommy. And she probably will kick you in the nuts and slap you in the face and tell you to get the fuck away from me. She will feel the energy, right? Women are already sick these days of being their men's mommies because that's, that's the Oedipal complex coming back to hit you in the ass. There's so many of these problems happening. Boys are not growing up. They're growing up with, with the tantrums of their mother. And that's what they think intimacy is. And then that's the energy they're bringing to their wife. And they're like, I got a boy at my hands. And as I gave in the example, the boy could be 200 pounds of muscle, right? And it's still the energy is the same. And the woman's like, I can't stand it when he touches me. Because he's still a 200 pound, seven year old boy. Wanting mommy. And she feels no containment from that. She feels no security in the first chakra. She feels no real power. Even though the man is built like a mountain physically. Emotionally, he's still a seven-year-old boy looking for mommy, right? And without that containment, you women are going batshit crazy. It is like the most widespread energetic problem I see in women's bodies. It is manifesting in so many ways that you don't even have language for it. I think it is what's mainly at fault for this quote-unquote masculinization of women because they are having to self-contain. It is a self-containment they're doing that they're referring to as I feel masculinized because there isn't. Never got it from your father. And the boys you're around, they never got trained in that this is what you're supposed to give to women. If anything, they got stuck in the horrible edible circuit with the mother where they were stuck in the emotionality of the mother's overwhelm. Right? They were still getting that, they were getting containment from their mothers which we really should not be getting past the age of seven or eight, right? And then they come to you expecting that from you, thinking that's what feminine love should do and deliver to men. And you're like, get the fuck away from me. What are you talking about? You feel revulsion once again. Revulsion is what that creates in the feminine system. When men come to you for containment, Right, and this illness seems like all over the place. I can't, every other conversation I have kind of tracks back to this. The basic complaint women are making these days is there is no way I want to be with this man. I, I just, they, they, they literally make a gesture of revulsion. They make a gesture of cringing. Like their energetic body cringes when the man approaches them. This is what the body is doing, like the wrong energy. Get the fuck away compared to when a woman feels that solid containment from a man, she leans into him, right? You can spot it across the room. You can see that room, like when, when a woman can get that from her man at a party, at a function, when her system is getting a little rattled, she'll kind of sidle over to her man and kind of lean into him, almost like she's recharging and grounding herself right? Because our system is going a little as it does in social occasions. And her man can just put his arms around her and she's like, mm. right? Compared to that, a woman who will avoid her man when that's happening. You'll, that way you know the circuit is not there. So, and that's like a very basic, it's like one of the basic things women want men for. And if men are not delivering there, Forget about having trust and intimacy that goes beyond that. There's no way your sex is going to open up to a man who's not giving you containment either. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Your sexual opening happens on the other side of receiving that containment. Right. And it's a huge concept, obviously, but how would you characterize it? You know, how would you, how would you describe to somebody who's never heard the concept of containment how would you introduce them to even the idea, which obviously is viscerally known? Yeah. Um, yeah. I can, as, as I do in the, in the videos, I, the simple way would be imagine how your system feels when you get a good grounding hug. 
somebody who's good at giving a hug gives you a hug and you receive their hug you like their energy and your system just goes oh. you settle into their body you receive their hug and your system quiets down your breathing slows down you feel more relaxed your head noise goes down that response in the body is what containment is right now men should be able to give that to their women from across the room not only just through their hugs they certainly should be able to give it through their touch and their hugs if they can't do that even with their touch there'll be no sex afterwards impossible right if the woman is coming in like in in this kind of energy and you're not able to like she's not going to open up sexually to you won't work try it Okay. So not I'm only does she need that before sex, she needs it after sex, and she needs it the day after. This is one of the biggest way I see women truly screwing themselves these days with the level of promiscuity they've got going on. You women have all, all the sexual choice in the world. You have talk on call these days with your apps. There's no shortage of dick. But the problem isn't getting a dick to the door and having sex. The problem is next day when you need containment and the man is not there wasn't part of your app contract and the women are flailing they are really not happy the next day when they don't have anybody when their system goes into that and it creates it is creating a lot of internal damage and they don't have the language for this all they know is i feel dropped i feel rattled and i don't know what to do about it and there isn't any contract in this dating and hookup culture to have those cycles of good containment from the masculine to the feminine and sex is simply in the middle middle of that neither do men have the awareness for this nor do women have the awareness for this so what we are getting is a lot of rattled women all over the place and this is not doing any favors to their psychological health over the long run right. it really isn't yeah, I think of it as the perfect match between a man's attunement, presence, and attention, and a woman's receptivity, you know, and, and surrender to that um, yeah. dynamic. Feeling, feeling contained opens up your receptivity. Receiving that containment from the man opens up your receptivity to him. Naturally, you don't have to decide it in your head. Your system will open up to him. And you know this is this happens at every level in lo in romance and love, but this is kind of the bread and butter of the BDSM realm, right. where we have a very specific concept of a dom taking a submissive into subspace, and it's exactly the same energetic. If you're a well-trained dom and you have a receptive submissive, first and foremost, you take them into deep containment, and the submissive pretty much falls into a trance state. And at the bottom of that trance state, the sex opens up, arousal opens up. Anybody who has done any kind of a rope play will, will receive rope provides amazing containment. People fall into a trance state right away, into stillness, their head quiets down. And in that stillness and quietness, there's trust, there's bonding, and now there's receptivity. Right, the same logic is needed whether you're doing kink or not, whether you're doing in a scene format or not. Right, but the Dom energy again is a very big energy, it's a very coherent, solid energy. Just as you don't want any shaky Doms, right? We don't, we don't want Doms with Chihuahua energies, we want Doms with Bulldog energy. And the same logic applies to men in regular interactions. You are not going to feel contained with men with Chihuahua energy. You just, you won't. Right? Amen. You need that big, great Dane who just sits there and stares at you, puts a paw on you, and all of a sudden your system goes. Zoom. That's, that's how the energetics works. This is not ideology. If the other way works for you, but God bless you. To get the Chihuahuas all you want world is filled with them right now right but you you know it and i know it uh that's not how things actually work so you wrote a book called prerequisites to ecstasy and i want to read a quote from it 
um, to close us out because you've already touched on how this all fits into BDSM. And I know for, I imagine for many listening, this is an entirely new uh, horizon. Um, so I want to read this quote because it speaks to what it is that I opened with, which is why the adoption of these principles of polarity and um, energetic complementarity can be the way out of warfare and endless you know, struggle and, and strife and unfulfillment. So you say, we all have a visceral understanding of what non-consensual domination and submission is. Every headline in every newspaper on every single day is pretty much a story of non-consensual domination and submission. What the structure and protocol of consensual domination and submission is requires some learning and mentorship. Consensual domination and submission is anchored in two people giving each other what they truly want. It is anchored in creating games and making agreements in which both parties win. It is anchored in affection and love between two people. It is anchored in two people wanting greater expression and joy for each other. Consensual domination and submission is in fact, sorry, in fact has a higher standard for how two people need to show up for each other if they are to do this dance well. They have to be in a deeper state of agreement. They need to communicate more and better. They need to be skilled at playing their roles individually, and they need to be invested in their partner doing well, because the two of you are on the same ride. I love this. And I, I want to just sort of close out, if you could speak a little bit to how could it be, you know, if, if, if in the Dom and the sub role, people have such different desires, intentions, um, how could it be that both of these needs are possibly fulfilled? Isn't it just one serving the other at a time, right? Or isn't it that oh, one yeah. sacrifice? You know, right? These are sort of like some of the, the, the resistance to this model is like, well, one is sacrificing in service of the other. But what you're saying is, no, this is actually a mutually beneficial contract that has a lot of transparency and a huge amount of, of consent. I think the fact that we even have to make that point shows how far we are from like actually understanding how nature is built. Nature is built on complementarity. Nature is built on polarization. Nature has created two sexes and the two sexes are not the same, but they need each other. So this is like saying, how can the, the, the cock and the pussy need each other? They are so different. Well, of course they need each other. Of course, when they come together, they both should be happy. That's how things work. We are built that way at every level. We are built to fit. We're not built the same way. We are we are not supposed to be at war because we are built, built differently. We are supposed to mutually fulfill each other because we are built differently. That's how we are built. We are built to fit, right? And that is like, should be the default wisdom that if there is a difference between us, we should be looking for ways, well, how do we fit? We should assume we fit. We should assume we are built to fit together in a happy way and let's look for that. Right. So this is, you know, we can come back to your original point. What is the core premise of feminism? The core premise of feminism is men have been winning at the cost of women, and now women need to win at the cost of men. That's the whole theory of patriarchy. And it is so plausibly sounding, and it is entirely false. It basically says men and women are in a zero sum game. We cannot win together. We are at war and only one of us can win. Men have been winning so far and that's enough. Now women need to win. That's why feminists will say, if men are failing, good. Men are dropping out of colleges, good. 65% of college is filled with women. Men are not going to college, good. It's our turn. It's our turn to win. Okay, have it that way. See if that works. I don't really believe that's ever been true. I don't ever believe that's ever been true. Win-win games is the way we are supposed to work. Win-win games are really productive. Zero-sum games are very strenuous and they're very limiting. Zero-sum games are the games of hustlers. You always have to watch out for number one. It's very isolating. It is very stressful. Part of the reason women are so stressed out is because they're locked in this zero-sum mentality that I have to win at the cost of others. I cannot be in an interdependent win-win relationships with men. That's an exhausting mindset to have, 
right? Create win-win relationships. There's an artistry in that. There's an artistry in creating that. You know, it is a very common analog for that is ballroom dancing. You need your partner to play a different part than you. That's how this particular dance works. You're not doing the same dance, like two tap dancers performing in front of an audience. You're dancing together, creating one dance, but your steps are not identical. And one is not winning at the expense of the other. You're creating this one beautiful dance, making each other brilliant, right? When I took my ballroom dancing class, the instructor would repeat over and over. He says, you know, why women have more steps in it than the men is this because the men's job is to make the woman look good. That's what you do in ballroom dancing. Usually the man has fewer steps. The woman has much many more flourishes in her steps. She is more beautiful. She is more feminine. It's better to put the woman on display. And you're going to help her be brilliant. You're going to help her be more beautiful. That's one of the functions you will perform in this dance. Excellent. Complete yes to that. Doms will do the same thing for their subs. Doms love to see their submissives getting off. Our brilliance is in taking you on a big ride. Men are desperate to make their women happy. Men don't want to be happy at the expense of women. Men can't even compute that when they are buying women. When they are buying strippers and prostitutes, they want to be good to them. They want to deliver. They want to, they don't have to, but their mind goes, was it good for you? Here's a gift. They actually want to make the woman feel good. We can't even completely, unless the man is totally psychopathic, when men have a very hard time even completely going into a mindset that I'm just going to get mine and screw the girl. Really, our esteem is not built that way. Our esteem is, am I offering something to the woman? Did I move the woman's system in some pleasurable way? Did I give her pleasure? Does she like me because of it? Men are built to please women. So we are not in a zero-sum game with women ever. We've never been, truly. We completely believe that if I can please you, if I can give you an orgasm, if I can put a smile on your face, that says I'm doing right as a man. I'm doing something good as a man. And I think that's a healthy instinct. So we are not stuck in a zero-sum game with you. It's women with this ideology who are stuck in a zero-sum game with men. Men are still sitting back here saying, I don't know what to do. All I want to do is make this woman happy. And I'm just, I just don't seem to be succeeding at it very much. And they feel demoralized. Right. We are made for interdependence. We are made to make, we are made to create win-win games together. I would argue that the the poisonous nature of this ideology is also pitting women against women. You know, the, the, it's, it's the same um, energy that actually is responsible for, you know, sister shaming and the competitiveness between women rather than sort of bringing all women up, women bringing all women up. And I actually think that a lot of the, um, the, subjugation of women now is being perpetrated by other women i mean it's it's like a full circle um you know snake eating its tail kind of phenomenon so i can I yeah i can certainly second that when i talk to women about when they certainly if they leave the ideological line they hear from women very quickly right i mean this is i tell people the biggest we are in the 21st century and we think you know we must be so sexually liberated by now we really aren't we seem to be going backwards and the biggest sexual taboo for women is to go into their submission so women are not going to say oh you have a genuine desire for submission you go girl you express yourself uh -uh. Uh -uh. submission to a man no we don't do that anymore and you do that and you're going to hear from other women Although I will tell you, I was recently speaking um, in front of about 2000 people at a nutrition conference. And as a part of the Q&A, um, it was a Western Price Conference. As a part of the Q&A, somebody was asking about the 
you know, my thoughts about the sort of gender, um, socio-political culture right now, gender related. And anyway, in, as part of my answer, I said the phrase, I don't know any women who don't want to be well handled by a powerful man. Yeah. And there was literally a collective um, that like this pleasure filled exhale that just swept the entire room. Yeah. So I yeah. do think we're at an inflection point where when you offer these, the, this vision really, it's, it's like a yeah. remembrance. It's a remembrance for our system. And that's why I'm so grateful for the way in which that you, you the way that you portray this vision of man, woman relating, because I do think yeah. that we feel it. We feel the longing for it. Even if we have resistance, even if there's confusion, even if there's like a, yeah, but doesn't he have to, huh? Um, there is a sense that the reclamation of, of sacred erotic union is not just something that you will into existence. It's not just something that you claim. It's a practice yeah. that you choose to participate in. And, you know, it's my belief that that is how we connect um, most powerfully to the divine and to the the source of our animated, uh, embodied sensual experience. And that is the antidote, you know, to so much of the, fra the fragmentation and disconnection that we are experiencing on holofractal levels, on all levels of our, our life, and that make us vulnerable to certain agendas. Um, so I want to thank you, you know, for be out, being out there speaking. My pleasure. You can truth to power in this in this way, and you know that you provide a lot of resources, many of which I avail myself of, uh, for people to learn more about this, both for men yeah. and women in person and online. And um, love your book, and thank yeah, thank you for being. But I, I want to add like one final note to what you just yeah. said, that this isn't just about. It is. Women often are in the mindset that if I get all those goodies that I want, I'm going to have to give something up. That it's going to cost me. There is a cost that comes at the end of it. And I would like to challenge that proposition. So put it bluntly, if I were to tell a woman that if you go into your submission, you will get good sex. You'll be like, oh, that sounds like a cost I have to pay to get my good sex. Even though I read Fifty Shades of Grey, I know there's something in it for me. And the deeper offer is this is a very superficial assessment that there are other things waiting for you in the, in the true embodiment of your femininity and submission. There are gifts waiting for you that you, you're not even aware of yet. There are expressions waiting for you that you're not even aware of yet. And uh, it is not going to have to be, the sacrifice is going to be about sacrificing the ego and the bad ideology. But going do deeper into your femininity, going deeper into a win-win modality with a man, going deeper into your heart, going deeper into your devotion. There are there are necess uh, necessary spiritual pieces waiting for women there that they don't have access to right now. It's very resonant. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much for sharing. Thank you. Yes.